Investment scams are making national headlines on a daily basis, and people's life savings are being wiped out. Next on Money Track, we're going to show you exactly how to avoid becoming one of those victims. Money Track is made possible by the Investor Protection Trust. The Investor Protection Trust is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Over half of all Americans are now invested in the securities markets, making investor education and protection vitally important. Since 1993, the Investor Protection Trust has worked with states across the country to provide the independent, objective investor education needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. This is Money Track with Pam Kruger and Jack Gallagher, bringing you real stories and real experts to show you what works. And what doesn't work when it comes to investing your money? This is Money Track. Hi everybody, this is Money Track. I'm Jack Gallagher. And I'm Pam Kruger. Today we're at the Halls Hollywood Drive-In. It's a diner in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And you know what? I'm going to show you exactly where it is for those of you who've never driven here before. I mean, I have lots of relatives in the area want to sell over in Marion, but we're uh, we're right here, very close to Chira Plisco. This community is pretty tight-knit. Really, you don't have to look too far to find a common connection between the folks who live here. And if you did live here, this diner is just the kind of comfy place where you'd, you know, grab your morning sure. coffee, maybe get a little gossip, or even maybe a hot investment tip. All right, now we know where we are, and our entire show today is devoted to one story that happened right around here. Now, once you hear it, you're going to understand why we needed to share it with you. It's the story of how this community, a community right in the middle of America, got scammed by a husband and wife team. It took 10 years to uncover this, but when mm -hmm. the swindle was finally exposed, the life savings of more than 100 local people, $13 million in all, already gone up in smoke. Now, these folks are not super wealthy investors, so they might not seem to have much of anything at all in common with the high net worth scam victims from the now famous Madoff scandal. But it's exactly the same game, exactly the same. It was just played out in a different place with different people. And whatever financial sophistication you think these small town people might lack, they more than make up for it in common sense. But even that common sense was not enough to save them from an investment pitch that sounded... What did it sound? Too good to be true? Too good to be true, yeah. Welcome to the town that got taken. Far away from the madness of Wall Street, a chain of small towns lie nestled along the meandering path of the St. Joseph River in northern Indiana, just miles from the Michigan border. The economic backbone of heavy industry and manufacturing is now severely slouched, and times are particularly tough, with unemployment rates nearing 10%, among the highest in the country. It is here where many in this community turn to a successful businessman prominent contributor to the local parish and trusted friend for generations for help when they fell on economic hard times. Thomas Squibb and his wife Marietta became pillars of the community. Most people living here couldn't say enough good things about them, especially about Tom. They thought the sun rose and set on Tom Squibb. He got a good reputation in those uh, church and social communities that he was uh, frequenting. A good reputation, but a false reputation. Turns out, there's a whole different story behind their so-called generosity. And it was about to ruin futures and bankrupt friends. When you go after and you take money away from the guy that was in your wedding, your best man, you drain him, you drain your neighbors, that's really a mean streak. <laughs> Let me tell you how it all got started. Going back more than 10 years, Thomas started telling his closest associates and friends about a fantastic investment opportunity. The story they heard was that eight to 10 select people were invited to invest in a KOA campground development in Michigan, as well as yet to be built condos in Florida. A surefire deal that would begin producing immediate interest payments of as high as 
The real story was that over 100 people, mostly from small Midwestern towns like Mishawaka and Granger, Indiana, lost more than $13 million. The trusted couple began scamming their dearest friends from 1993 to 2005 before anybody caught on. These are people that all their life they have known you, they trusted you, a significant amount of trust, and you violated that trust. Not one KOA campground or a single Florida condo was ever built. As it turns out, the Squibs were selling an empty dream. The whereabouts of more than $3 million of the investors' hard-earned money, still a mystery. But just how did so many friends of the Squibs get taken? And why did it take so long for the scam to be discovered? You don't really expect someone in their 70s to be defrauding people. I mean, you can't be the nice grandparent, grandfather image and yet basically be a crook. It's a huge Ponzi scheme that you take money from later investors to pay off earlier ones. And to those earlier investors, everything looks okay. State investigators were contacted as soon as investors stopped receiving their so-called interest payments. After doing the simple research usually required by anyone who's considering a new investment, they found absolutely nothing real behind the opportunity. Just an all too familiar story. Had they called our office to say, hey, this man's offering me this great deal, is this legal? You know, we could have said, they're not registered to do it, the notes aren't registered, and, and don't, don't invest with the guy on the street. Ah, but you see, by promising as much as 48% interest, the squibs could keep their scam alive for more than 10 years. Some of those early investors did get high interest payments, but only so the squibs could attract new investors. And the way most of those investors got involved, they knew somebody else. And in turn, those people recommended this investment. But when the economy slows down and losses uh, start to be taken, and as people get hurt and start checking their records more closely and talking with us and talking with others, they realize that they've been taken. And the investors were taken all right, eagerly handing the squibs checks from as low as 5000 up to several hundred thousand dollars until it all blew up in 2007 with the arrest of Tom and Marietta Squibb. Just because that person was referred to by a friend or family member doesn't mean it's okay. You have to painstakingly, with tremendous discipline, get third-party objective information about the investment and the person doing the investing. A device even the most savvy of investors sometimes ignore, as proven by the multi-billion dollar granddaddy of all affinity frauds we all know now as the Madoff Ponzi scheme. And just as in that disastrous fraud, even after the criminals have been exposed, most victims won't see the bulk of their money anytime soon. Basically, right up front, we tell most of our uh, victims that are reporting stuff is, money's probably gone. So what is the difference between a Thomas Squibb and a Bernie Madoff? There's more money in New York than there is in South Bend. And they both went after close associates, friends, relatives, and they both came up with schemes that were basically uncheckable. While the victims continue to wonder how to recoup their investments, the Indiana Special Prosecution Assistance Unit has seen their fraud caseloads escalate as people become desperate looking for easy retirement money in a tough economy. Thomas Squibb died while serving his first year of a 17 and a half year prison sentence. His wife Marietta continues to serve her eight year sentence in a federal correctional institution in Illinois. She's up for parole within the next few years. All told, more than $20 million was scammed by the elderly couple. They were able to live very comfortably for more than a decade Meanwhile, investigators continue searching for the $3 million that is still missing. The squibs had prepared well, that where things were well hidden or placed somewhere that we wouldn't be able to identify them to take.
Now, none of the victims wanted to be identified in the story, but I can tell you, everybody here was touched in some way by this scam. Jack's over there chatting with some of the people who live here. What is the reaction of people in the restaurant when they hear stories like this? Well, they, they feel very sad for the person who was scammed. Uh, I mean, and sometimes it could be their friend who scammed them, I mean, and so they're mad. There's a lot of mixed emotions about it. Well, I thought how easy it could happen to almost anybody. And why is that? You kind of trust your friends, and a friend thinks it's a good deal, and you think, well, they probably are not wrong. They know a lot more than I do. Now you can't trust anybody. I mean, the way it's going on, the way the economy is right now, because everybody's trying to scam everybody. Who do you trust this day and age? Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to watch him. I don't know what my hey, you want to make a quick buck? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we have a question for you. It's the Money Track Quiz Question of the Week. What is behavioral finance? Is it A, how we react when we find out we've made lots of money on an investment? B, is it an actual field of study that explores our unpredictable behavior when it comes to money, even the movements in the stock market? C, how depressed and scared we get when we see the stock market take a swan dive? Or is it D, all of the above? And we will have the answer for you later in the show. So I'm, I'm back with you now. Yeah, yeah I think so. You know, the story that we just saw, mm -hmm. it was the promise of 48% returns that lured these investors in, but the reason that the squibs were able to keep those phony camps and condo stories going that long was because people actually really trusted the squibs. Right, and you've probably heard the term before, mostly from the Madoff scandal, but this kind of crime mm -hmm. actually has a name. It's called an affinity fraud. Mm -hmm. Back with us now is Indiana Secretary of State Todd Rakita, and he's going to lead us through today's very important investment. 101. Todd, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure. We've heard the term affinity fraud before, even especially with the Madoff case. They all met at the country club. That was the common bond. Mm -hmm. Tell us exactly what is an affinity fraud. Well, a affinity fraud is, is one of the worst kinds of frauds, really, and it's perpetrated by those who we've come to know, love, and trust. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you know somebody, right, is right. the old saying. So it's about using that common connection against the person. Because we trust them, we think there's no need to do due, due diligence. Right. And this happens to uh, the smartest of us mm -hmm. and also the simplest of us. Mm -hmm. So give us some of the... Uh the biggest warning signs of affinity fraud. What should we be looking out for? Well, like other kinds of fraud, uh, affinity fraud um, acts on pressure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you are pressured by someone who says, hey, we need to make this deal now. Mm -hmm. right. If you find that they cannot give you a prospectus or anything in writing. Nothing on paper. Or a business plan, another red flag. The folks who invested in this case wrote checks, money orders, and wired money directly to Thomas and Marietta Squibb. Now, normally, if you're making an investment, you're not going to write the check to the financial advisor. You're going to write it to the bank or That's the right. brokerage firm, right? Yeah. Most investments are run through financial advisors, right. go through brokerage houses. Mm -hmm. So that's who you're going to write the check to. That's who you're going to get a statement from. But it goes back to your point about this being a, a fraud that happens within a comfort zone for people. Yeah. And that might be the reason that people think, well, I don't need to check. I go to church with this person, and they're not going to mess with me in this way. And, and you get a false sense of security from that angle, which would keep people, again, from mm -hmm. checking. Well, let's take the Squib case, for example, mm -hmm. that we're focusing on here. Um, the ground that they were supposedly investing in, the campground, mm -hmm. was an hour away from the church that the Squibs were members at. If any one of those investors mm. would have just driven that one hour and saw that there really wasn't any campground, they would have known. It's that, that strong bond that you have with someone that causes them to be able to take advantage well, of you. Well, speaking of checking on people, registered or licensed financial advisors have rap sheets on file with you folks, with the state securities regulators. That's right. And any one of us can go and find out information. Right. Telephone. We or... can call your office. You can call our office. We have trained representatives that will walk walk uh, you through the names, the brokerage houses, make mm -hmm. sure they're registered. And I know that we can also go online. Now, which website 
do you recommend that we go to right now? Well, it, it, here is how the uh, regulatory part of the industry works. There's there's federal, there's state. Mm -hmm. We all we don't overlap. We don't duplicate each other's efforts, but we share a lot of ground. Okay. And I don't think that's bad. I think that's good because you have more no, that's great. one more eyes. eyes looking at all this. There's a clearinghouse for all state securities regulators, okay. so that should make it uh, much simpler. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by going to NASAA. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now I'm there. And now we're going to start the search. Okay. And I'm going to type in, just for the fun of it, Thomas Squibb. Okay. And no what? results. No results. No results. So he's not in the database. And that's why it's so important for us to not only look, but then when we see nothing, you have got to pick up the phone and let someone like me know. Because not only can you be saving your own skin, but you can be saving oh, the yeah. financial skins of yeah. many of those around you. And if it's a case of affinity fraud, you can be helping church members, people down the street, mm -hmm. and even family members. Sort yeah. of like a, a security dog. <laughs> That's to right. guard your uh, investments and your property. I, I know just the dog do. who can do that. Do you think I might have brought it up for that reason? <laughs> <laughs> Todd Rakita, Secretary of State of Indiana, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank Appreciate you for it. being in Indiana. Thank you for being in the heartland. All right, we're going to have step-by-step -step instructions on how you can do what we just did here and check your own financial advisor or broker's background, even if you already trust that person. It's all right there on our website. Just head to moneytrack.org. Mm -hmm. There's Chloe doing her job as mm -hmm. usual. You know, this makes me wonder, and you'd know better than I because you're a former stockbroker. Do you think that the victims just didn't know they could do the background checks or...? Or they probably didn't believe that they needed a reason to check. After all, the squibs were very dear friends. They were trusted. They were in each other's weddings. It's a fair question, though, because so often investing has more to do with emotions mm -hmm. and behavior than it does common sense or even financial sophistication. We see this over and over again. So let's take this apart and mm -hmm. let's look at the emotional aspect of how we deal with our money. And to do that, joining us right now via satellite is Dr. Phil McGraw. Of course, we all know him as Dr. Phil. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Dr. Phil, this is like psychology 101. So often we think of our best friend, if, if that person has money invested with somebody and we respect our friend's judgment, then heck yeah, it's got to be that good. Well, Pam, I think, first off, most of us, including me, are not sophisticated investors. We rely on what we do know, and what we do know is relationships. We do know eye contact. We do know whether or not we trust somebody. And if we trust that person that's referring us to someone, it's kind of like any friend of yours is a friend of mine sort of thing. You kind of bet on the people instead of the program because you don't have all the information you need about the program. It makes sense. You're honest. Your best friend's honest right. and gives you this tip. And so... I suppose it never even enters your mind that there's somebody somewhere along the line who's cooked up this big lie. We can't even fathom cheating our friends, cheating charities, cheating people that uh, we go to church with and that we see on the street every day or down at the corner diner or the bank. We can't even conceive of doing that, so it's hard for us to imagine that someone else could do that. But even if you were financially sophisticated and you did know what kinds of financial reports to examine closely, you'd probably be inclined to totally ignore the warnings because let's face it, only a chosen few were invited to become part of this exclusive club. And I think that blinded people a lot. I mean, it was kind of like, gee, I, I feel good if I'm one of the inside investors here. And I think, again, the emotions kicked in and really blurred the objective vision that even sophisticated investors had. All right, so, so what about the, the, the squibs, the Bernie Madoffs, and there's that other guy? That's that, Sir Robert Allen Right, who supposedly this character was stealing billions yeah. of dollars from his so-called friends. I know that people who tend to do this kind of thing uh, certainly have a lot of sociopathic characteristics to it. And it's called mm -hmm. a lot of things, sociopathic, psychopathic, antisocial personality. But there are people that just don't have any conscience. They just don't have the ability to feel remorse. They don't have any empathy for the pain they cause with other people. Let's listen to what Bernie Madoff actually says back in 2007. This is in a roundtable discussion in New York. Now, in this clip, he's talking about how you can't get away with fraud. Watch this. It, it, you know, in today's regulatory environment, it's virtually impossible to, to violate rules 
And this is something that the public really doesn't understand. And you, if you read things in the newspaper and you see somebody, you know, violate a rule, you say, well, you know, they're always doing this. But you, it's impossible for you to go under, for a violation to go undetected. Certainly not for a, a considerable period of time. They become addicted to the respect. They become addicted to the money. They become addicted to the lifestyle. And they don't have the foresight to say, you know what, this is going to hit the wall. But because they don't think ahead, because they live in the moment, it feels good now. The respect that we get feels good, the money we have. And I know in the Squibb situation, they apparently were quite generous within the community, which is easy to do when you're giving away other people's money. But I think they got, they very likely got addicted to the admiration that they were getting, however fantasy-based it was. Well, Dr. Phil, we thank you so much for being with us today for your incredible amount of common sense and your insights. Thanks. You know, all of these friends, these business associates, fellow churchgoers mm -hmm. who got caught in the squibs net, each victim really did believe that he or she was among a chosen few to be invited to invest in these campgrounds and these Florida projects. And that club mentality is the common theme, whether you're talking about billionaires or thousand heirs. Right, and I can understand that being almost a thousand heir myself. <laughs> but I mean, are we really that gullible? It's a, I think it's a matter of feeling important. You want to feel important. Right. You've been chosen by somebody. You don't tell anybody else. It's just you and me. But with mm -hmm. everything that we're seeing, you hope that we get smarter as we move forward. Now, let, listen to this one. This one is from around San Francisco, right near where I live. Get this. A Tiburon couple pleaded guilty to an $18 million scheme. Now, get this. Involving the sale of a large non-existent diamond. That's sad. It's also the same kind of diamond that my wife has, which is non-existent. <laughs> All right, let's show you our web address again. There she is, that cute little labradoodle. Mm -hmm. You can find us online at moneytrack.org, and we'll have the top five things you absolutely need to do to make sure your investment advisor is playing by the rules. All right, Pam, now it's time to answer our Money Track quiz question. Are you ready for that? Yes, I am. So the question we asked was, what is behavioral finance? Is it A, how you react when you find out you've made lots of money on an investment? Mm -hmm. B, an actual field of study that explores our unpredictable behavior when it comes to all things financial, even including the way the stock market moves? Is it C, how depressed and scared you get when you mm -hmm. see the stock market take a swan dive? or D, all of the above. Right, yeah. and the correct answer is, it is all of the above. Mm -hmm. Our behavior and our reactions to things that happen every day actually play a huge role in finance every day. This, now, this gets us to the last part of our show. We even have a little title for it. It's called What, what We've, We've Learned. Learned. We want you to walk mm -hmm. away with three things that you can use to make better investment decisions. And hopefully safer ones, too. So number one, we saw with our own eyes how easy it was for this one couple, the Squibs, right. to dupe their entire community. And that went on for more than 10 years, all based on phony promises. Because, as Dr. Phil pointed out, one reason they got away with it for so long was because the investors really wanted to believe this was happening. It's Psych 101, and emotions played a major role. And when you do decide to make an investment, don't make the check out to that advisor's name. Squib Ventures turned out to be a complete fraud. Your check really ought to be made out to the bank, the financial institution, the brokerage. It's the fiduciary where the money's being held. That way you're going to get two sets of statements, one from the actual, actual brokerage firm or the bank, and the other from the advisor. And then you can compare and you can see that your money is really invested where you think it is. And no matter how much you trust somebody, you can and you should do your own background check on any investment advisor, broker, any type of salesperson who's promoting an investment opportunity. Even an insurance salesperson with annuities, anything. And then if that individual's name doesn't show up, like we just saw with Thomas Squibb, as being registered or licensed in any regulator's database in any state, don't get involved. It's your money. We just want to help you hang on to it. So check out our website, moneytrack.org, and that is our show for today. From the Halls Hollywood Drive-In in Fort Wayne, Indiana, we want to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. So long, everybody. So now let's look for some good news in the paper. Good luck. Find something. But I got this great opportunity coming up. I can't, I can't, I'd love to bring in on it, but I don't think I can. It's with yeah. a Nigerian prince. Yeah. Can I get scrambled egg whites? No swine, no, no toast. How's it work? I send him a little bit of money, and then he sends me like a ton of money. Help! 
Not in my contract. No, no tomato. Can't eat tomato. Do you have avocado? No. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. Have a chili dog. Relax. Yes. It's a good deal. Get in on it while you can. Door's gonna shut. Boom. Locked. Hey, listen, we've got this really cool investment deal. Okay. You want in? I want in. No! <laughs> no one didn't know what you were doing! I thought that was correct. <laughs>